part of their traveling master's program. So I'm going to ask Rachel to tell us a little bit about how that works. Yeah, of course. Um, so hi, I'm Rachel. I'm the executive director of the Dramatist Guild Fund. So we're the nonprofit arm of the guild. Um, and we support all writers for the theater. Um, whether you're a guild member or not, we support you. Um, but you should be a guild member. But you should be a guild <laughs> member, yes. Very important. Someone asked this morning about how you join the guild. And on the paper that uh, we had in David's class this morning, it has the address and everything on it. But the best way is just to hit your website, right? Yeah, the website, dramatistguild.com. And there's also a town hall meeting at 430. If you're interested in becoming a guild member, I encourage you to, to come and find out more about what we're about. Um, and so the fund supports writers through emergency grants to individual writers, grants to nonprofit theaters across the country, and also our educational outreach programs, of which the Traveling Masters is one of those programs. So we bring prominent writers like Tina, and last year we brought Christopher Durang, as well as composers and lyricists to regional theaters and schools around the country. So I'm here as a playwright supporter today. <laughs> and Mr. Durant's had a pretty good year since we saw him last. Yes. So, Tina, may your may we be the blessing oh. upon your year <laughs> as well. Um, Tina, you want to talk a little bit about what being a traveling master means and what you've done with it? Um, I think it means passing the torch. I think it means crawling out from under one's own lonely rock. <laughs> and meeting other people who live under under lonely rocks and saying, Looky, we're still alive. <laughs> we still move. You know, we got out from under our rocks and we are still writing our plays and we are still raising our voices. Um, and I and I think it's about about making connections and reminding all of us that each of us have something within us that nobody else has. And that when you write for the stage your obligation is to put on stage what has been missing in your eyes, you know, what the stage needs that only you can provide. And so um, it's sort of a it's sort of a mantra with me. So I I enjoy traveling around and I have to say that I love South Beach. <laughs> I love that road with all of the people, um, the huge margaritas that are this big and have their in them, and all of the, the vendors with false food trying to get you to come into their restaurants with all of those <coughs> sort of young um, starlets if or prostitutes, I'm not going <laughs> to uh, But I, I love the feel of, of Florida and, I, and all of that. And I love the, the cruise ships, which I think are all going to come in this weekend. I think they're so ugly, but they're certainly so romantic. But, mm -hmm. but, I, um, but I wanted to sort of reach out to you and remind you that, that what we do is is very lonely and makes us paranoid, but it's very, very important, so that's why. <laughs> wow. I think we can all take that and go home with it. That was worth the weekend for me right there. <laughs> um, Steve and Lauren are new to uh, city rights and, and the idea of really having um, some writers who are directly Excuse me. excuse me, so excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see me. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie's jealous because right. last year she got to sit on this panel. <laughs> um, I don't think she's jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's what happened. <laughs> um, so Steve and Lauren are um, both new to, to city rights and to city theater and um, those of you who were with us this morning, um, as I had been working with Susie and the Tunit City Theater over the course of the year, we'd been talking about um, some playwrights they didn't know, that I thought that they should know, and uh, people that I knew that wrote short form and people that I thought were just really great, uh, cool writers that would fit in with this vibe really well. And um, oddly enough, while I had, I initially approached Steve and said, hey, by any chance do you have this week open? In the meantime, then they picked Lauren's play to be in their children's programming. Those of you that are still with us here on Sunday are gonna get to see that. And I happen to know, as I think they probably, that Steve and Lauren are the best of friends. In fact, 
when Steve was recently Lauren's maid of honor at her wedding. Master of honor. Master <laughs> of honor. It's a maid of honor. I can own it. <laughs> and so then, in the meantime, Susie's like, oh my god, your friend Lauren is coming to do this. And I was like, okay, you cannot have one and not both of them. I think we have a slightly different version of the story. Do you? That's good. So, so <laughs> in the meantime, then, um, one of the things that we've always talked about uh, with City and having, I've only been a part formally of the organization for a little while, but have um, spent my time in South Florida seeing the festival. I think I've seen all but maybe two Probably, of them over yeah. the years. And um, have been peripherally involved quite a bit. And one of the struggles is always that you, they pick the plays, then they pick their company. And inevitably, those of you who have produced uh, and especially we've worked with a company, no matter how you try to divvy it up, there always ends up being an actor who has less to do and an actor who has too much to do. And they, we were talking about this and I said, well, the other thing that Steve Yaki has is this astounding ability to just have output all the time. He just writes more than anybody I know. And the fact that for years he worked with Actors Express in Atlanta, which is one of our NNPN member theaters, um, writing their intern showcase. So he would be given a group of actors, get to spend a little bit of time with them, and he would write a play for them to do. So I said, why don't you guys talk to Steve about the possibility of writing a piece for whatever leftover fill-in you need to do? And thus came the piece that you saw last night. So. Um, Steve's been done a little commission work, kind of, sort of, for this program. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I also knew that they both are really excellent, wonderful teachers, and I loved the idea of being able to have them team teach today, as well as being part of it. So that's why I brought them here, and my version of the story <laughs> of how they got here. Which is the only one. No, that's, that, it's, it's roughly the same, except for like that fun Nan part, which is where you said to Lauren, Steve's coming, so you should come. And you said to me, Lauren's coming, so you should come. <laughs> <laughs> but, at, but at the same time, before either of us had agreed to come, which was amazing. <laughs> well, I, I think when I, my, I, someone else pointed this out to me last night, probably my son, that when I ran my list of things I've been called, I left out manipulator. <laughs> <laughs> so, but in a great way, but in, in a great, great way. way. Perfectly. Um, so talk to us a little bit, you two, about why you teach and why you like doing convenings like this, because I know you both do a lot of them. Um, I just wanted to say, to start with, and I mean, just as a deference of respect, that like, Tina is the master on this panel, oh, and that, like absolutely. to be on a panel where we're called masters with her is really odd to me. So that that's all. Just Tina's the master on this panel, and we are here to help. So, um, but uh, I don't know. I I love things like this because there's always a really great energy. It feels like like people crawling out from their personal sort of like retreats where they write to form community and to revisit community because the community is always there. It's just that we don't engage it, and so I think that. Um, for me, that's always, like I always leave these things feeling exhausted but refreshed, or like re-inspired to, mm -hmm. to continue to work, because I'm one of those people that's like, everybody should write, we all rise together, like, you know, my work is different than your work is different than your work, and so we're all creating new audience, because if they don't like what Lauren's doing, or what I'm doing, they might like what Tina's doing, or, you know, the, so we're all growing audience by writing and like working in the field, so I think it's exciting. Lauren? Um, I will also defer to the master that is to my left, but uh, pr primarily because um, the, my, my Tina House story is this amazing place she would have called Approaching Zanzibar, which I was in when I was 11, <laughs> and it was one of the reasons that I started to be um, a playwright, because at that point I'd only done plays like, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird and, you know, 11-year-old versions of, like, McBee, <laughs> which Wait, and that was a, a lot of Actors pitches Express, that right? Actors Express, but, uh, oh, 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 oh. So anyway, that play reminded me that, wow, like, they, they are new plays, and they sound like a version of poetic modernity, and it's such an incredible play, so thank you for being brilliant and inspiring me, even though you didn't expect it. Um, I'm sure there's thousands of us who would, would fall in that category. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I, I love being in these scenarios because I think inherently, both informally and formally, we start to learn how to describe what we do 
even just casually over drinks. Oh, what good kind of plays do you do? Where are you from? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And I think the more you can kind of say and claim, one, I'm a playwright, always good to know, um, and, and to claim. And two, to kind of say, you know, I do write with um, a lot of, uh, I, I write science plays. I write, I write plays that are uh, ferociously funny um, in, in a way that's my version of activism is through a kind of rageful comedy. Um, or uh, wh whatever it is you do, and I think even though definitions can kind of box us in sometimes, I think it also can strengthen the core of what you know you're good at, what you know your voice is, and there's that great power to move. So I find those conversations happening a lot here, which is great for you all. Tina, when did you first say out loud, I'm a playwright? Was there an incident that made you know this is what I'm doing? Um, okay, this is it's sort of, Interesting, I come from a family of writers, the Howes. They're all minute, and they all have deeply set blue eyes, and they're all wildly insecure, because the, the loss of blue blood is, is essentially uh, very um, insecure, and, 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 and all, we all feel that we're imposters. But yet, I came from this family of writers, and so growing up, it was always being read aloud to all the conversation around the dinner table was, what are you reading, what have you read? So I wanted to be a novelist. And so when I went to Sarah Lawrence, I took a short story class. And they made a rubber stamp, worst in class, bong, and it went right up over my forehead. I couldn't, I couldn't control the language. I didn't know, does she enter the room? Does she slide into the room? Does she insert herself into the room? Does she spatter herself into the room? And I, and I was a disaster. And it was my senior year, and I was supposed to write something wonderful, and I just had pages of adjectives, and so out of desperation, I decided to write a play, even though I had never studied playwriting, and I had no idea sort of what a play was, but I wrote this, and being Sarah Lawrence, God kind of love it, I wrote a play about the end of the world. Of course, what else would you write? <laughs> <laughs> read it and said, ah, I want to direct it. And at that point, this was back, you know, in the 18th century, <laughs> people came to school and with horses and carriages, and nobody had ever done a play as a student before, and all the theater department heard was, play me. And so they said, yes, Jane, please do it, thinking that she was going to be in a production of Caucasian Talk Circus. <laughs> so she directed this terrible, pretentious play of mine, called Closing Time, about the end of the world, and mercifully, two days before it was to open, the lead actress got sick, and so Jane took over. And it was a triumph. It was a triumph. Shit, and it was a triumph. <laughs> 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 so it's like author, author, what did I know? And I was a D student, and I ran out and started throwing kisses. And a little bearded man came up to me, and he said, Oh, Tina, Tina, I'm, I'm a composer. I'd like to turn this into an opera. That was it. You know, I had never studied playwriting. I never went to graduate school. After that extraordinary experience, my father said to me, Tina, you can either go to graduate school for a year or in Europe. You know, so of course, I said, I'm, I'm going to Paris. So Jane and I hopped on, on, on an ocean liner. Her excuse was she was going to Edinburgh to study mathematics. I was going to the Sorbonne to study philosophy. Within a week, Jane was acting in The Fringe, and within a week, I was writing the great American play in a little garret uh, right over the Pont Neuf. And a friend took me to see um, Inesco's The Ball Soprano, and seeing that play, which was really about my family, because they're very high-blown and lots of conversation, but basically it's all gibberish. But as with this performance, it was done completely, you know, soft while with a, with a straight face, all of this gibberish. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, I'm like, yes, this one. I was born, and I thought, oh, this is, this is it. This is, this is what I should do, that UNESCO sort of mimes and um, explores and transforms life as in terms of the male world of power and identity, and it is my job to do this for women. Mm -hmm. But I never went to graduate school, I never had a mentor, I never had some kindly older man pat me on the head and say how talented I was. I, I, really don't, I don't really know what um, restoration comedy is. I don't know much about 
much of anything, and I sort of taught myself. But um, and I think because I'm self-taught um, as a teacher, because I never had a mentor, I desperately want to be that old man, <laughs> silly old man who has a limp and a kidney problem. <laughs> Well, I know that has been such an important part of your life and career. Do you do you find yourself, uh, as you have grown as a, as a playwright, has how you mentored people changed? Um, um, well, now that we started an MFA, Hunter, um, and we can choose our students there, they're ever so much more uh, accomplished. Because in the old day, any, anybody that was getting a master's in theater could take the class and they'd think, oh, playwriting, that sounds like fun. But now we get writers who have been around the block a few times and who have had productions. And um, I'm sort of in awe of them. And I feel, I mean, I always feel, I've said before to some people, that I feel my job as a teacher is to be a mirror. And because I'm so tall, I could be a full neck mirror. My <laughs> job is to reflect their play back to them. And whatever it is that they're trying to do, I have to sort of walk through the mirror and help them build that up. And so I've never really had an agenda. I think, I think what we need more than anything, all of us, is, um, is, is, is to be seen and is to be recognized, to be acknowledged. And I think it's rare for students to be acknowledged, and I think it's rare for us as Likes to be acknowledged, and so I'm just this big mirror walking around, and I don't think anything's changed except I've gotten terribly old, and I keep telling everybody, playwriting is so hard. I'm really 20 years old. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens. And this is what you follow. So um, you know, I have wonderful students, and, and, um, and they teach me. So I don't know what else to say. Lauren, I know you are actually, you came through the Young Playwrights Inc. program, which um, I don't know if you're aware, but our scholars are being worked with with them this weekend, and those folks are actually teaching a teacher lab today. Um, you obviously had some wonderful mentors along the way and have uh, helped shape careers. So the idea of, we can, yes, we all acknowledge Tina's at a different level of masterdom, uh, but do you feel that it's important for you to do that, pass along, to be the mirror for people? Well, uh, I, I have benefited greatly from, from great advice. I feel like I have had fewer mentors. Um, I feel most of my time, uh, until I was 20, whenever I was in grad school, I didn't take a playwriting class ever. It was just you know, reading Beckett first, which means my first ten in the plays were nutty. <laughs> um, and then kind of reading Tennessee Williams and then Miller and kind of going, oh, 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 okay, okay, okay. And then of course realizing, wow, there aren't that many women playwrights that I can read in my local library. I need to go seek those out. Um, and so all of that was kind of developing my, my own voice and, and through productions that I was able to get when I was Um, uh, in an evening of you know three other kids that were like me, it was uh, an amazing moment to go. Oh, this is this is a job. This is this is a craft. This is an art, um, not just a hobby, not just a thing um, that you can kind of do while you go be a lawyer or something else. Um, and so it, it, it kind of worried me that way. But but I, I definitely feel in many ways self-taught to a point where I was desperate to for the grad school experience, which provided me the sense of, of structure and how to get some of the messy thoughts. Um, into to, to walk a little bit, not in a straight line, um, but in the same direction. <laughs> um, so like everyone just, just walk over there. You can walk in diff different places and your different gates, but everyone aim towards the decline act, please. <laughs> um, so that, that, that definitely helped me. But I
you will be able to see your work through their eyes, which is an incredible gift. You can shake yourself out of your own personal BS or <laughs> your own personal cloud. Stay hang out for a second because I want to <coughs> go just back a little bit. Um, because both of you talked about being women playwrights and how that's different. And I know it's something the Guild has a great interest in. Those of you who follow 2 a.m. theater and Howl Round and you know that there's been a lot of um, sort of political upheaval in the last few weeks about women playwrights. And I have to say, I was astounded the other night when we lined all of you finalists up and what I think there were two would have been three men um, and the rest of you were women and the idea um, that there aren't women playwrights is obviously silly the idea that women playwrights aren't getting produced at the rate that they are that's another level of discussion um, but talk a little bit about how that world has changed Tina in your career and then Lauren I'd love to hear what you think as a woman at this level, how it feels to you about that? Yeah, the numbers are still not good. I was very active on the Lilly Award that um, Teresa formed four years ago when, after the drama, uh, drama awards, whatever they were, the drama desk, um, nominations came out and there wasn't one woman and she emailed a group of us at two in the morning saying, what do we do about this? And Marcia Norman by 9 a.m. said, we have our own awards. And so now we have the Lilies where we give awards not only to, to female playwrights, but you know, actors and designers. Um, and Julia Jordan always speaks, she's she helped one too. And, and the numbers are still very bad. However, um, I find that, that more and more women are being produced. And it was very interesting. Yesterday I met with some of the young um, scholars, we call them the high school kids. And it was all women and one guy. And, Nine, and, yeah. the, and the majority of the women were young African-American women. And I said, I just have to tell you, I'm on the Lark, which develops plays by sort of emerging, more than emerging, really sort of almost their playwrights. And that there's a, there's a real noise being made by the emerging um, young black American uh, female writer that this is that this is really happening and that I have that I'm friends with a lot you know Pretori I was there to hear on the yeah. mountaintop and Chisa Hutchinson and Tanya Barfield and you know countless others and that there's something's really happening there and even though see here's what's tricky here's what's really tricky the numbers are great but nothing is more depressing than hanging out with the women who are always complaining about, oh, nobody does our plays, and it's always the men. And, and it's, a lot of these women are sort of, dare I say it, women that have never been produced and that are really pissed off because they're not being produced. And mm -hmm. so they, it's all about the, the glass being half empty and, mm -hmm. and this tirade. And, and I've been asked, I'm oh, awful, I hope this is a neat tape. My mom <laughs> often been asked to join. Oh, stream. It's being streamed out over yeah. the internet, all over everywhere. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't do the internet. I don't even know what streaming is. <laughs> don't worry about it. It's fine. You're fine. You haven't said anything that's said. Just don't use any names. No, I would never use names. But, <laughs> but here's the point that, that what um, Teresa and, and, um, and um, Marcia and Julia Jordan wanted to do is they wanted to celebrate with the male voice. And so by creating the lilies, okay, so maybe only 17% of plays being done are by women, but what wonderful women they are and what wonderful mm -hmm. plays they are. And, and I think there was recently um, when uh, Ensemble Studio Theater announced their upcoming uh, you know, uh, marathon of what, 12 plays and two of them, and it was immediately a great uproar. And I ran into Billy Carter, who's the artistic director, and I said, Billy? And he said, I know, I know, I know. A lot of things went wrong at the last minute. So my sense is that things are starting to relax and that and that women, it's not that we hate men, and it's not that we're angry at men necessarily, it's just that we want to, we want to celebrate our own voices. And I think as long as we look at, at the glasses being half full, I think things are really helpful. But if you're a political activist, maybe you would bite my neck and say that I'm oh. No, I think you're absolutely right. Oh. I, I think there's a couple of different levels, but um, it's true, absolutely, that the numbers aren't kind to female directors, female writers, female design. But, but one would thing that was interesting to me is um, to look at it from the numbers of female uh, roles, 
written, whether by men or women, because I'm actually sitting next to one of my favorite feminist writers. I was just going to say. Steve's work is incredible, and his female characters are deep and complicated and evil and wonderful and joyful and all of the things. Um, and so I think it's, this is where men and women can come together, because really what the issue is is female story. That, and often, even if um, you know Shakespeare, great roles for women, except they are generally like two out of the twenty roles are women. So we have either to choose from Ophelia or Gertrude, and well, they both die, <laughs> and, and and they and you know we, they they aren't given a lot of development, and it's all in the context of man. So there's there's a lot of the issue of like how we can all help that even place um, is not just through female writers, of course. That's that's. Um, enormously important, but to look at the plays that are being done and do count these numbers. In San Francisco, there's a, a wonderful movement that's coming about from this kind of feminist community. And uh, unfortunately, some of it is a little aggressive, um, and, and I, I don't think that's helpful ever, um, because I think we're smarter than that and, and classier than that. Uh, and and that's, how you, that's how you win, is out, out class. Um, and I, I do think that um, so what we found, though, is that oftentimes, certainly in equity, and at least the Bay, way more of the equity contracts go to men than women. And then it's a labor issue. Um, if you have the exact same number of male and female equity actors, but the roles that, that in the plays that the theaters are choosing outweigh vastly um, the female opportunity that's, that's there, then and that's not that's not quite fair. So it, it's a moment for you as a writer, because it starts with you guys. To, and, and I consciously go, am I assuming that's a man? Does it have to be? And sometimes, yes, it does, and I can't. Out Does the story have to be that little boy or little girl? Um, and what that does to our collective conscious, because the more you put females at the center of the story with the actions, with the risks, and taking the chances, um, then it's more likely that females do that in, in real life and we finally get that female president. What? Hey, shout out to the. Rachel, do you know, I know you can one, uh, the spot, but do you know what your membership is ratio wise, male to female? I don't know. Do you know what's going on? I don't know. Do you feel yeah, that? I don't know. Usually numbers are fairly even. Like yeah, they yeah. Went, I, would so, so I would assume, assume that it yeah. is. And I I often, I was, you know, you get to the point where you're passing out sage advice. I really I found myself doing this often recently, which has made me realize I've really crossed over that age line. Um, but I was with a, a group of women at TCG, and we were discussing diversity, both uh, racial, racial diversity and gender diversity. And I was saying that when I first started going to Lord meetings, I was one of the few women in those Lord meetings who were managing directors of the Lord theaters. And now it's about 50-50. And that's in a pretty short, as old as I am, that is in a pretty short time frame in the scope of the world, how that has changed. And a lot of that changed because there were, there became uh, theater admin programs across the country, where those management programs, there used to be, there were so few of them, and they were turning out mostly male students. Once there was an explosion of those programs, the programs became more available, then there were more women students, more women who were being trained, and people couldn't keep them from the job. And, and frankly, what's qualified. interesting, it's not just that we're being nice and fair thing. 60% of the ticket of the audience, the butts and seats, are female. 70% of the ticket buyers on Broadway and in regional theater are, are female. So our audience actually is female. So there's, there's a justifiable reason to go, wouldn't you want to see more of your stories out there? Yeah. I mean, it's waiting there for us to kind of say, we're complimenting you, thank you, for sitting there and going to the, and bringing your husbands and sons along the way. Steve's play Pluto that we were speaking of earlier that's going to be one of the rolling world premieres next year uh, has a, an absolutely uh, beautifully written, devastating uh, female lead in it. And I wonder, do you, do you, Steve, do you often think of that? Do you think, well, I really want to focus on a woman's perspective, or this is just the story I want to tell, and this is the person I want to be there to tell it? Does it enter into your thoughts? I think it's, this is the story that I want to tell, and this is, this is who needs to, to be at the center of it. I mean, like, if you're writing something that takes place, like Bellwether, for instance, that we're going to read later today, or tomorrow, I guess. 
um, some of that. It's ten actors, I think it's seven women, three men, um, because it takes place in a gated suburban community and it deals with uh, sort of mothers and neighbors and, and whatever that community is. So those are the people that needed to be in the play. Uh -huh. um, I, don't, I, I definitely don't sit down and think like, I need to write a play about a woman, but I also am not one of those people. I, I heard very much early in my career, well, you can't write women, and I think that that's stupid. Um, I, think that the, I think when people tell you write what you know, they mean start out by writing what you know, but then get better at writing and go write whatever you want. Uh -huh. like, <laughs> so uh, I definitely think it's one of those things where um, it's what's best for the character. But I have to say, I really love writing female characters a, a lot. Well, you, and you see it in your work. Tina, do you have a do you have a sense of over the course of your career, have you written more women women than yeah, men? Yeah, I, I don't necessarily think about it consciously, but um, it's funny. Honor Moore, the poet and who then, and a playwright uh, and a biographer who wrote this book about her grandmother and then a book about her father who was bishop of the Episcopal Church. Um, in the early days, she produced my first play, um, uh, Birth and Afterbirth, and. She used to say, which are you first, Tina, a writer or a woman? And I said, oh, I'm a writer, because I come from a family of writers. And I never knew I was a woman until I was about 40 years old, because I just <laughs> never thought I'd be married or a mother. I just was a, a brain, a sort of a goofy, a goofy clown, a generous <laughs> goofy clown who liked to write. And it wasn't until I began writing plays that it seemed to be were all about women um, and women's issues that I realized, oh, no, no, I'm a woman first. Um, because it's, but I was never conscious of, of that. And when I tried to join a women's group, oh, God, I, I got to tell you this. Okay, in the height of the women's movement, we lived in, in Columbia County, there was a women's group that met in Columbia County in, in Hudson, New York. And I didn't know any of them. And, and we all sat in a circle, and we were all in our 30s. And I was ushered in. I didn't know anyone. And we began sharing. And so the first woman goes, oh man, I just had a baby and I, I don't know what to do with it and I feel, I'm so afraid the baby's gonna die and I'm so inept and the baby cries and my husband's at work. All I do is cry all day. I'm just, I'm just so miserable. I fully explain. The next woman, I have three children and all they do is cry and fight and my husband's working in the gas station and I don't know what to do and I don't know what to do with them and my other friends aren't any help. Tina, it's your turn. And I say, well, I'm working on this play, and I had a really hard time ending the first act. And, I was so and there was this silence. And then, oh, you're a writer? Oh, you're here to get our stories. You're here to take our stories and steal our stories. Out, out, out of the womb. That was my first experience with the women's movement. I was banned. Banished from them, <laughs> um, and I and I felt for them, you know. And, and little did they know, I was writing *Birth and Afterbirth*, which is a, a play about how women compete about fertility. Because my husband and I took five years before we had children. And my German sister-in-law would say, "Tina, you are not a woman until you have the children." And I thought, "Wait a minute, wait a minute. This is this is this is deeply perverse and deeply destructive." And so I wrote a play about. A family who has a child, a, lo a, a child celebrating his fourth birthday, played by a large hairy man, <laughs> and, a, and a couple who doesn't have a child who are anthropologists. And I have them collide, and so um, it's a great I, you know, I never was conscious of it, and the women's movement would have none of me, and I. To write, I don't think it's about writing about what you know. I think it's about writing about what you don't know. It's about exploring the mysteries and the conundrums and the regrets and the desire for revenge. Mm -hmm. You know that that you don't write the story that's all perfectly laid out. That you but you hop on top of that ache and that tremor mm -hmm. and you write it to the end. I think that's the, and I bought you a stamp that I want you all to stamp on yourself or on a book. Here's a full print. No, 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 but this is it. And I thought you all needed to have an imprint of this. This is Dear Samuel Beckett saying, when you're up to your neck in shit, all you can do is sing. Fabulous. Take it, stamp it on your head, add something that is important to you. Um, okay. <laughs> so what are you working on now, Tina? Not mine.
and um, it's just this is this is exactly what is supposed to be happening at this conference, and I just want more of this to kind of go out into the world. And thank you guys a lot because I know we have to wrap up and get to this next the next session. session. But if you have a couple of questions, maybe you better get a question you want to throw up. Yes. Yeah. You must have been happy to see the last Tonys with two the two top directing awards were females. Were female. Yep. That was great. Fine, fine jobs done. Yeah. yeah.